So what advice would you give to someone who's perhaps are listening to Richard Carrier? Because that's the thing is, as I've looked into his content, he casts disparaging remarks upon all of scholarship or whichever scholars he disagrees with. He often says that scholars really agree with him on certain issues that it seems like you're saying they don't, at least on, the, on some issues. And um, but if you don't know scholarship and you don't know this hi history stuff, but he's your filter, like if Richard Carrier is your filter for history, then you think that all the stuff he's saying is accurate. Like what advice would you give to someone who's been influenced by him to kind of come out of that shadow of Richard Carrier? Well, if, if you like Richard Carrier, then read some other skeptics. Read Bart Ehrman, read Gert Ludemann, read Morris Casey, read what they have to say about, about Jesus. Now you're seeing some serious scholarship who are trained not in the classics, but in historical Jesus scholarship. Uh, and there is a difference. When I wrote my most recent book, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels, that came out two and a half years ago, um, I dealt with the, uh, like Plutarch quite a bit and some of the others. And I have to admit, my learning curve was very steep, and I would have made some egregious errors if not for uh, two classicists, who um, three classicists, who reviewed my material on Plutarch. And one in particular, who has become a very good friend of mine in the meantime, um, he, he corrected me on a bunch of things and steered me through the minefield. I would have made some terrible errors. I just thought, you know, this is ancient literature. It's around the same time of Jesus. I'm going to, you know, be able to get through this pretty well because I know what I'm doing with Jesus. And no, it's different. And mm -hmm. classicists are going to make the same kind of mistake if they think they're coming to the biblical literature and they're just going to know it and know how to navigate through it without any kind of real study in the area. So Carrier makes some egregious errors when it comes to these things. Um, so what I would say to a uh, mythicist who really like Richard Carrier, look, if you want to be a skeptic, read some other skeptics. Read some that are, you know, have some great academic credentials and reputation um, like Bart Ehrman, like Garrett Ludeman, like Morris Casey and, and others, and see what they're saying. Um, and then I, I would also say, look, when I, I don't know how many bona fide scholars there are now in the relevant fields of New Testament studies and history, uh, classicists who would say that Jesus did not exist. I don't know how many there are now. I know just a few years ago, Richard was saying there were seven, including himself. Um, that's not a lot. And none of those seven were widely regarded within their discipline. They weren't really respected within their own discipline. So when you observe that, and when you observe that virtually everyone who is forwarding the position that Jesus never existed are internet bloggers, then I would be stepping back and saying, you know, I think I see some red flags here. Maybe I ought to think about this a little bit more. And maybe they'll just say, well, oh, come on, you know, if it, even if it turns out that Jesus did exist after all, it's no big deal for me right now to think that he didn't. I mean, what harm? Well, the harm is, is not to anyone but yourself because it would show that you're gullible. When I mean, scholars really look at Jesus deniers as mythicists to be on the, on the same level as conspiracy theorists who think that we never walked on the moon, that the Holocaust didn't occur, um, and, and these kinds of, of, of things. So it, it would mean if Jesus actually existed and, and you're falling for this, then that means you're gullible. And that could also mean that you have a tendency to go for these kind of conspiracy theories. It doesn't mean you're not intelligent. Uh, 22 years ago, there was the Church of Venus cult led by Marshall Applewhite. And um, there were some I think 39 of his followers, uh, you know, some of them were very intelligent. They were engineers, but they were gullible and they paid a price for it. They paid with their life. So just be careful. Um, that's, that's what I would say to him.